think, yes, that's good. This is, the, uh, this is the backup mic, so if this doesn't work, the good news is the presentation is mostly lots of pictures and very few words, so we can go really old school and I'll just do a kind of slideshow. Um, uh, and there's about 90 of them, so I'm going to warn you in advance, I'm going to talk probably very quickly for about the next hour or so. Um, and um, as, as Ryan alluded to, really what I'm going to do is, is um, take you through a whole series of um, projects, ideas, and trends that hopefully you'll find uh, interesting and, and may have some relevance to um, your own scenarios. Um, they're of a, a range of different kind of scales. So some of them are from um, you know, larger cities like London and, and New York, but I think the, the thinking and the ideas are applicable in lots of different settings. So uh, it'd be interesting to sort of unpack some of that and what that means for, uh, for Townsville later on in the discussion. So uh, I'm Peter. Um, I'm going to do a few slides just to kind of introduce myself so you can see where I'm coming from and the particular lens that um, I put on this topic. So uh, I guess something that, that I've done over the last few years is an uh, e-commerce site called uh, culturelabel.com. Um, this was something which, uh, along with the, the other co-founder, we set up in 2009. Uh, and the reason I kind of mention this is I guess I'm coming at this as a, a creative or a cultural entrepreneur, however you want to describe that. And we'll have a go at definitions later. Um, and this was an example of where I guess culture and uh, commerce have, have come together using technology as, as a platform. Um, Culture Label was a really, really simple idea in, in 2009 when we set it up, which was simply, um, you know, we, we used to sort of wander the amazing gift shops of some of those incredible cultural institutions in, in London, in the UK, places like the Design Museum, the V&A, the Tate, uh, and we just thought, actually, is there anywhere where you can buy, you know, amazing design products, limited edition art online, uh, which we felt was actually kind of very affordable. I, I was working in the arts at the time. Um, a lot of my friends would say, Peter, you work in the arts, you know, I've just bought a new apartment or whatever, what should I buy? And it didn't seem to me that actually there was a kind of curated place where you could go to buy those things. Um, so this was the kind of genesis of the culture label idea. Um, and we were incredibly fortunate. We were able to bring together eventually over 500 cultural institutions around the globe. So, you know, some of them on the screen behind us. And um, it was one of those amazing businesses that was hard not to like. So 90% of what we made went straight to cultural organizations. Um, and we brought hundreds of thousands of visitors onto that site by the time we sold it in um, 2014. Um, and I think a lot of what I'll talk about tonight comes back to are there ways that you can develop new types of business models, new thinking around um, what I hope Culture Label did, which was to take art to, to new audiences, but also it generated a commercial return for the cultural organizations, but also it deliberately, quite deliberately, this is a for-profit enterprise because what we were able to do with that type of business model behind it was to attract investment, to build the website, to employ people in order to, to grow that particular business, to market it to wider audiences that possibly hadn't come into contact with some of these organizations. Um, so it was quite a different approach, a different way of doing things back in 2009. Um, out of that experience, um, I got very passionate about this whole area of, of creative entrepreneurship and, and what new models, what new thinking there was around you know, reaching audiences in new ways and, and ways of, of finding where, I guess, of making what you do sustainable and scalable and, and how you build creative enterprise that hopefully also has this kind of cultural element to it as well. Um, so I mentioned a couple of books I mentioned earlier, Intelligent Naivety and Remix. They're both free to download off, off the website. So some of the ideas and the thinking that I'll talk about is, is contained within those. Um, we spend a lot of time working with some pretty amazing organizations, putting some of this thinking and ideas in, into action, both in the, in the cultural sector, um, but also in the commercial, the tech sector, working with organizations like Skype and, and Google as well. Um, again, I'll mention some of those projects as we go through the slides. Um, and, and going back to um, uh, what was first talked about, my sort of current project that we've been working on for the last three or four years is, is Remix. And Remix is a very um, deliberate attempt to bring together uh, creatives and innovators from a whole range of different industries, you know, like tech, um, various sort of business sectors, bringing them into the same room um, with the, uh, the cultural sector to share their thinking around um, conversations and topics and themes of, of mutual interest. And as a way of um, expressing that, probably the best thing is just to see uh, the Sydney event in action so you'll get an idea what that's about.
Remix is essential uh, for our nation. It can't be anything but instructive and inspiring. It's about constant new ideas and new ways of doing things and throwing out the old and trying new. It is my great privilege once a year to get to come home for Vivid and to get to participate in all the activities that are happening and Remix is part and parcel of that. I'm very excited about this, uh, this future because I think bringing together these different disciplines, we can all learn from each other. When you're looking at, at work which is being created now, which is vibrant and real and urgent and, and necessary, we don't even understand it. Being written off is the best thing that can happen to a trend because the trend comes back stronger. Ultimately, our profits don't go into the pockets of a media mogul. Our profits fund the next 200 years of, of independent journalism. The incredible thing about digital technology as a tool is its ability to allow kind of seamless collaboration and sharing. This is the web. This is what the web is about. This is manifesting the philosophies of the web in the physical space. The, the networks and the collisions and accidents and conversations that happen around events like this are really important, not to mention the, the sheer inspiration of hearing some of these people tell some pretty amazing stories about things they've been involved in. Make a mark. So in, uh, in June this year, we had close to 2,000 people over two days came along to um, our main sort of remix event in Australia and in, in Sydney to hear from a ludicrous number of about 160 speakers. And you get a sense from some of the, the names there that I'm a huge believer in how there is this convergence of creatives from lots of different um, sectors that are, are the answer to um, you know, where new forms of innovation and ideas come from. Um, and obviously I'm coming at this more, I mean, I've worked in the tech sector with organizations um, you know, like, like Google. Um, I've spent most of my career in the arts. I've spent time as a, as a tech entrepreneur. Um, uh, but I'm coming at this from the kind of the arts and the culture and that creative industry standpoint that I think a lot of the um, ideas and solutions from my perspective are coming out of conversations and shared dialogue with other uh, creative sectors. Um, and a, a really good example of that is a space that we, we run in Shoreditch in East London, which is kind of the epicenter of the sort of tech um, revolution in, 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 in London in the UK, where um, uh, Boris Johnson said recently, and probably I will question the validity of this statistic now, post-Brexit, where it turns out not everything he says is truthful, um, but he was claiming that somewhere in the region of half a million jobs had been created in London in the tech sector. Um, and given our sort of networks and um, obviously sort of remix event, we thought it'd be really interesting to create a space where technologists, artists, creatives could come together. Um, so this is kind of Shoreditch and uh, this is our kind of space, which is in a uh, rather ugly looking uh, 70s warehouse. Apparently I've got a, a pointer. No, there isn't a picture of it there. But anyway, there is a, a whole range of different businesses that are, for me, are the kind of creative entrepreneurs in action. And a good example, I guess, of what I mean by a creative entrepreneur uh, is this lady here, Lisa, who is a, a friend of mine, and she uh, was an editor of a, a, an archaeology magazine that shall rena uh, remain nameless, uh, but was probably one of those people that was slightly frustrated with her job and felt more broadly that archaeology wasn't doing a great job of appealing to new audiences and wasn't really benefiting from all of this innovation and excitement around um, new digital platforms that was happening in, in, in you know, cities like London. Um, so she came up with an idea which was sort of like a, a kind of Kickstarter for archaeology. And if you... Um, 
are not familiar with Kickstarter, this is a platform where, I think everybody knows what Kickstarter is now, but it's a platform where you go out and, and you raise money from people in order to make big ideas happen. And she created a platform whereby you could crowdfund uh, archaeology digs, which is obviously quite interesting in the context of public funding cuts and a different way of doing it. But what she realized was that actually her core audience were the kind of hipster types. Um, and what she needed to do was to kind of rebrand archaeology for them. So her idea, and this is going back a few years ago, was uh, under the brand Dirty Weekends, but probably not quite the, the weekends that you're, you're thinking of, um, involving actual dirt and archaeology digs. And she's crowdfunded now digs all over the world uh, and has been very, very successful at actually proving there is a commercial model in it, but which is also making, obviously, archaeology happen and also taking archaeology to new audiences. And what's been really great about it is recently, because she'd been able to promote, prove that there is a commercial model within there, similar to Culture Label, the example that I mentioned before, she's been able to raise investment. So she's now been able to uh, employ a team of people. Uh, recently, she signed up this uh, chap as her chairman, who you may better know him as, if you follow English comedy, Baldrick from Blackadder, who is the, uh, the host of Time Team, which is one of the UK's most popular archaeology programs. So she's really been able to develop something which, as I mentioned, blends that um, cultural output with something which is commercially viable and indeed scalable. So she could keep obviously growing this and hopefully funding more and more archaeology digs around the world. Um, now, the second thing I guess I want to say before going into some of the trends is you know, my view of culture and, and creativity is incredibly broad, but I think sometimes we get caught up within, you know, models that have kind of grown up around us in terms of what we think culture is. Um, and often it's, it's internalized, it's this notion of, of going to an institution, the idea that culture is in a box. Um, often it's kind of passive, the, 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 I guess the thought that culture somehow is a kind of spectator sport, um, obviously not in all cases, but often, you know, it can be thought of in that way. Um, often culture is time specific, so you need an appointment or certainly you probably need a, a ticket. Again, not always the case, but often these things are uh, ways of framing culture. But, but where is this going? Where, what are the kind of new definitions of culture? And I think of this almost in a kind of an Airbnb sense where suddenly, you know, cities are curated by hosts who talk about what's important about their city, what's the culture, these new curators are, are emerging. And you can see that suddenly culture is everything and creativity doesn't really have any boundaries. Uh, and often this is also being reflected in obviously a changing kind of art scene. So this is the South Bank Centre in, in London, um, which has benefited from a, a very expensive um, you know, renovation over, over the last few years. But what sits behind it and uh, Jude Kelly's, uh, I guess her artistic vision for the area is that it is very much an everyday festival. So she's taken the culture out of the box and really it happens all along the kind of riverbank now and this really is one of the most vibrant um, and parts of the city. Um, culture is everything including food of course. Um, um, also it can be created by anybody. So this is a, another example from New York, Governor's Island and we had the, uh, the president of Governor's Island come to speak at Sydney. Of course it's the US so everybody's a president. Um, and she talked about actually how their model was when they looked at this island which is a former uh, naval base which closed in the 70s which has been reopened over the last 10 years was they were in a city full of um, um, you know, amazing curator institutions like the MoMA or the Met Museum. So there was no point trying to compete with them and create something which was just replicating an existing form of cultural experience, you know, curation with collections, uh, you know, etc. What they decided to do was to create a whole series of spaces which could just be colonized by creatives in whatever shape or form that creativity might be. Um, and it was phenomenally successful to the point, a bit like, um, you know, Jude Kelly's Everyday Festival. When you arrive at Governor's Island, you almost don't know what's going to happen that day. Day. Often the team don't know. They're massively and incredibly peddling in the background, trying to give the illusion that everything's spontaneous, but of course there is some form of curation and, and structure around it. But it's, it's become known as the kind of um, really alternative creative hub of the city, um, to the point that actually what's interesting now is there's been big plans announced to um, create a whole tech district on this space as well. And it's come out of the fact that Governor's Island is just known as an incredibly creative space where all of these cultural happenings are taking place. 
So the tech whiz kids are going, okay, we want to be part of that. Actually, we want to hang out alongside other creatives. So very similar to what we were trying to do originally with Remix and London, find that shared space where creators from different worlds and different disciplines can come together. And of course, what that means for something like arts and culture in a, in a world where every city is trying to describe itself as a creative location. And um, what, what it means is there's a kind of post Silicon Valley model where every city said, let's build an innovation district. And what they mean is we'll have a load of startups and tech companies. Culture suddenly could be that kind of magic ingredient that actually unlocks a new type of model about what a creative city is, but also significantly is seen by government and other stakeholders is really important because it's a thing that actually gels some of those tech industries, which as we know are kind of at the top, top table of government. Um, another area in terms of why culture can be created by anybody, including the audience, of course. So there's this huge growth in, in the maker movement. So Maker Fair, which is um, one of the great examples of, a, of the kind of the event that represents DIY maker culture around the world, now has around a million visitors a year. So it's become a really sort of big thing of you know these makers again from all shapes and sizes. Um, and culture obviously now is incredibly kind of uh, social and particularly in urban areas it's seen as um, you know an alternative to the stress of, of urban life. Um, and then what's great is obviously we're having these kind of new opportunities that are coming from this uh, collision of, of tech with the growth of what you might call the experience economy. So urbanomics is a kind of really interesting phenomenon for me, which is the idea that um, in areas where you've got kind of dense urban populations, that suddenly you have the scale where kind of culture can pay. So businesses like Culture Label or um, Dig Ventures and the, uh, the, the Dirty Weekends model suddenly are, are possible to kind of grow them as scalable uh, creative models. Um, and it's been helped by obviously this move towards experience away from possessions, particularly exacerbated by the GFC, and also really driven by social media because if there's a good idea and people like that idea. It's obviously incredibly cheap and easy to share it now. So everybody has the power to share it an idea in a way that just wasn't cost effective before. Um, and a nice example of that actually is, is Y Plan, which is a an, an app which um, exists in London now and a number of other cities. And, and they basically said, look, we're moving towards kind of spontaneous uh, cultural experience. And what they did is they created an app um, and they looked at the kind of market and said, well, you know, um, why can't we create something which is really of the moment, giving somebody something to do either tonight or tomorrow? And they looked at models like lastminute.com and said, well, how last minute is lastminute.com if I can book a, a hotel or a, a holiday three, four months in advance? Why can't we create a very curated experience driven by a kind of an app on a mobile, which gives somebody something to do in a very spontaneous way? So I'm going on a date or I just fancy being kind of challenged. So they do kind of eight to 10 events each night um, and often it's where there might be kind of excess capacity in an exhibition or a show, so they're able to offer a discount or they offer an added value element to the experience like a glass of wine or combining it with dining. Um, and this is now suddenly on two million Londoners' phones. So what happened was um, overnight, you know, this happened over a six month period, they suddenly shaped how people were experiencing art and culture because if you're on two million Londoners' phones, you're pretty significant then in terms of how people decide how to spend their time and how they spend their money. But it just shows you the power of this experience economy and the new models that are emerging. And of course, that then allowed them to raise a whole ton of money through tech investors, 20 million pounds or about $40 million um, in order to scale this very quickly. So they launched it in New York and various other cities. And again, these things will arrive um, and they're moving much more quickly than that was ever possible before and suddenly the whole box office for culture is revolutionized by somebody who probably wasn't even necessarily thinking that they may have devised it around sporting events or something else um, this is a kind of phrase which uh, the Atlantic sort of threw out recently which I thought was quite an interesting statement um, again we can kind of discuss this later but the notion of the death of the artist but the birth of the creative entrepreneur um, so what is a, a cultural or a creative entrepreneur? Well, I tend to think of it as using this equation. So um, the, the notion that basically we've all got assets in our organizations or as an individual kind of creative, whether that's our networks, our spaces, and, and you work out what those assets are, and you basically apply them to consumer trends. So um, no matter who was the entrepreneur, whether you're talking, you know, Richard Branson or, or, or Zuckerberg, at some point they worked out what they had, what they could create, and what the, what the audience or the consumer trend was and how it applied to them. And if you put those two things together, you obviously then start to spot opportunities. What's the gap in the market? What's missing? You know, in the same way that Yplan did with, with their model when they looked at the kind of lastminute.com and said, look, we can do better than that. 
And then out of that, obviously, you then develop a strategy to turn the idea into reality. And I guess what makes cultural entrepreneurship interesting for me is it's about this mix between, yes, there'll be a kind of revenue and you need to monetize that. And that's particularly relevant because, you know, having, you know, I live, I live in Australia now. I've lived here for the last two years, but really experienced the, the cuts that happened in the UK in the public sector and the impact on the arts. You know, money is important. Getting resources is important if we want to get our kind of show on the road. But what's really interesting about this is the way you do it through entrepreneurship is actually something that we want to do in the arts anyway, and we do a lot of, which is audience development. And if you can get that audience development right, which is a great example of the Dig Ventures one, where they said, okay, there's a new audience here, and this is how we monetize it, then that's where, for me, cultural entrepreneurship can be a really, really positive thing and a different way of doing things. So I would say... This is a really great time, actually, to be a creative. You know, it's our time to be dangerous. The rules have completely changed. Uh, culture's being disrupted, just like every other industry. And we can all name those industries. Um, and what we're finding is there's this new generation of creative entrepreneurs from all over the world that are basically blurring culture, technology, and entrepreneurship in that remix way. Um, and it's being enabled, obviously, in many ways by, by digital, by the internet, which suddenly gives any individual, you know, the power that often used to be in the hands of the corporation, which would have had a monopoly on marketing and distribution, through things like social media and the internet, we've all got that now. You know, I can have an idea like Culture Label and relatively quickly set that up and, and, and get that up and running, and it can scale in a time that was just previously inconceivable at a cost level which was previously inconceivable. Um, so, as I mentioned, it means great ideas. If it's a great idea, it can scale very, very quickly. Um, an example of that, and this is a, a large-scale example, but it was very, very small when it first started as, as Secret Cinema. And has anyone come across Secret Cinema? Um, so, so I, this, this is a guy called Fabian Riggle, who's again, is a great example of a, a creative or a cultural entrepreneur. So, so he looked at the cinema experience and said, you know, why are we all sort of sat in an audience like this facing a screen? And it came out of a kind of dream that he had as a kid, which was he had all these movies that he was a huge fan of, and he wanted to step into the world of the movie. So he said, well, rather than making it that kind of passive spectator experience, why don't I build the world of the movie? And he started doing this seven or eight years ago, and it was relatively kind of small scale at first, and a lot of them were kind of cult movies. But he has scaled the concept to the point that last year he did Star Wars in direct partnership with Disney. Um, and basically, he built the world of Star Wars. And to give you an idea of, of, of how he has scaled this idea, I mean, the numbers are fairly mind-boggling. So he built Star Wars over 18 acres of sets. So it was truly enormous. Um, 100,000 people visited and paid £78 um, pounds a ticket, or again, you can roughly double it. Um, um, so you know, in the region of $160 a ticket, uh, which created a box office of about 7.8 million, which put it in the UK box office top 10 for 11 weeks. And this is just somebody who, who had an idea seven or eight years ago, which was, we need to change the way that we experience, experience film, experience cinema but was able to scale it. And the way he scaled it actually was through social media. So the notion of secret cinema is, is just a great branding exercise. So I mean, I remember the first time I went to Blade Runner many, many years ago, and I was like, oh, this is great. And of course, you know, what they tell you is they don't tell you what the film is, they don't tell you what the location is because it's a secret. But like anything, if you have an amazing experience, the first thing you do is tell somebody else and you tell them through social media. So this thing went gangbusters. And of course, he's got hundreds of thousands of followers on on Twitter, on Facebook. So all of their marketing reach is entirely free. And over a period of time was able to prove that obviously you could scale it as a, as a, a cultural venture, but also as a commercial venture to the point where you're doing deals with Disney. Um, again, give you an idea of the scale of what they're doing now. The year before they did um, Back to the Future, um, where they took over London's Olympic Park and built the entire town of Hill Valley. And if you're familiar with the, uh, the movie, you have everything there, like the school and the enchantment under the sea dance, the famous clock tower they built. Um, uh, and this became, again, a real sort of cultural um, phenomenon. Um, again, 85,000 people went to the Olympic Park to watch it. Um, they do a lot of other things around the productions. You go for eight hours, so there are kind of gigs there. Um, there's an amazing retail and, and food experience around it. And also, they're marked, again, very clever. So they'll actually take over, in this case, stores around London, turning them into a record shop of the era or a diner of the era as part of the marketing. So they actually go out of the production you know, in, into the city as a way of actually reaching out to audiences. 
Um, a similar example, again, would be uh, Punch Drunk. Again, it's gone very, very large scale, but was a relatively kind of small thing um, that was funded through the private sector initially, which is the reinvention of theatre. So, very similar concept. Again, you know, why do we sit in a theatre watching a production when actually we could build the world of that production? So, Felix Barrett, the, the entrepreneur behind this, um, he had the idea, again, six or seven years ago, and he got his break because... Again, he went to the Arts Council, a number of kind of funders, and said, look, I've got this idea. A lot of people said, it's a great idea, Felix. You know, I'm kind of really interested. You've obviously got an amazing mind, but just couldn't get the funding to make the idea happen. And in the end, he went to a private sector property developer, and the property developer sort of could see how actually this idea could happen, you know, with the right kind of backing and funding. Um, and they were planning to do a major kind of redevelopment in the kind of Wapping area of London and agreed to write a, a, a pretty massive check, actually, for somebody who was a relative kind of maverick at the time um, um, to allow him to take over a three-story former Royal Mail sorting office and, and Wapping um, to do their first production um, uh, Faust, which was one of these things that when it started, relatively few people have heard of it, but again, because of social media, by the time it finished, tickets were exchanging um, hands for several times face value, and it became a real cultural phenomenon. And on the back of that, they moved to New York, and some of you may have come across Sleep No More, which is their um, production in New York, which has pretty much been one of the top-rated uh, productions in New York for the last five or six years. Um, and again, it was a model which was possible to kind of scale. Um, so Drown Man was their most recent production in London. And again, this is an organization that just didn't exist that long ago. 200,000 um, uh, uh, people com coming, sorry, yeah, 200,000 people coming along to a 200,000 square foot uh, warehouse in, in London. Um, you know, it's a pretty amazing figures. And what's interesting is they're now starting to have an impact on other parts of the art sector. So um, the Royal Maritime Museum, which is, you know, one of the national museums in the UK, but it's probably not one of the more sexy ones unless you're into kind of naval history. Um, but they realized the two organizations that they'd had a huge amount in common because they were both storytellers. Uh, and again, they tended to be a certain way of going about the development and showing of exhibitions at the Maritime Museum. And they got together with Punch Drunk and they said, okay, maybe there's a different way of actually telling this story, or indeed two ways. So there is the kind of the exhibitions, uh, uh, which they've done together, but there's also this theatrical experience where a certain number of uh, young people each day will go off and will do the kind of Punch Drunk take on the exhibition, which is a series of stories and some of the sets that you can see here. And in the evening, it becomes more of a kind of an adult orientated experience. Um, when Punch Drunk and the Maritime Museum announced they were going to do this, the Maritime Museum smashed all of their box office records, which again shows you how this organization, which didn't previously exist or very few people had heard of, had almost become the big draw. Um, and it's really changed the way they think about telling stories. So all of this stuff's kind of happening, but what is the infrastructure you need to kind of support cultural entrepreneurs and for these ideas to start happening? And as I mentioned, for me, a lot of this is about engineering creative communities, whether you can do that top down or, or organic bottom up, but it's really about this kind of post Silicon Valley thinking and not about governments and cities chasing their tech district and saying what we've got to have is a load of tech entrepreneurs and that's going to be our future because everybody's trying to do it in the same way as we all try to build cultural districts, which we were sort of chatting about earlier. Um, it's about these more broader creative communities which make cities A, where you want them to live, but for me, as I mentioned, is where some of this new thinking and innovation will come from. Um, and it's not just me saying it, and this is Google's MD in Australia, um, and he recently said in the press, um, you know, talking about that innovation comes from the intersection of different disciplines. And he talks about, you know, the X factor. In this case, you know, it's about STEAM, um, you know, the idea that arts is part of education, not just kind of STEM thinking. This is fantastic, you know, the fact that, you know, senior people from Google are saying the arts are a key part of, of what makes a place, what makes a city, what makes a society, what makes industry creative. Um, and actually, Google have just announced, uh, or recently announced, that they're moving their UK headquarters to King's Cross in London. And they said the reason they were doing that is because of all of the other creative institutions that are around that area most prominently the University of the Arts, because they said Googlers are creative people and they want to hang out alongside the artists and the creatives to kind of riff off them. Um, but it's not a new thing. Turns out, actually, this is quite an old thing. So this is a picture of one of the Enlightenment era, era um, coffee houses in London. Um, and the coffee houses are really interesting because 
you know, back in this time, um, um, you know, the water wasn't particularly safe, so, you know, lots of people were drinking very kind of watered down ale and, and gin and the like. Um, and coffee arrived from Turkey, and it's sort of known as the sort of rocket fuel uh, of the Enlightenment, where some amazing kind of innovations that shaped the, the modern world came out of these, these uh, coffee houses, which were places of, you know, riotous uh, conversation, you know, no holds barred, radical conversations in a world where actually there was less boundaries between disciplines. So the people you have there, obviously you'll see it's a very sort of male dominated space, you know, which is obviously how um, society was um, structured in those days. But you, in there you'll have your artists, your, your merchants, uh, your scientists that came together to discuss the big issues of the day. So things like the modern stock exchange came out of this space. So really what we're doing with Remix, our view of cities and creative communities, is kind of going back to what we were doing before we started putting boundaries and walls around everybody's disciplines. So if it's about creative collisions, then what does that mean for infrastructure? Um, possibly this is kind of one of the answers. So this is a second home. This is a, a co-working space in, uh, just off Brick Lane in London. And it was a really interesting space because, again, co-working spaces have tend to be spaces where technologists hang out to talk to one another. And, you know, somebody like Wireplan that I mentioned can get a benefit of being alongside other technologists. Um, there are hundreds of these spaces now in London. And Rowan Silver, um, who's the uh, co-founder of Second Home, he said, well, actually, I think what would be more interesting is not just having tech people speaking to tech people, but why don't we have a much broader cross-section of creatives in our space? So he kind of put this advert out there, which was, we want to create a second home, because obviously you spend a lot of your time in these spaces, for London or the UK's leading creatives. And we don't care, we'll care whether you're a designer, an architect, a technologist, we want you in our space. Um, and as part of being in that space, you obviously have the serendipity of conversations that may lead to new ideas and, and, and innovations, but they have an amazing curated program in this kind of um, social hub and restaurant space at the heart of it, which actually looks like an arts organization. You know, it's, it's film premieres, it's uh, talks by uh, architects, artists. It's, it's incredibly kind of cultural experience as a space. Um, He's now working directly uh, with one of the uh, former architects at the Serpentine Pavilion to create a space which is very much now a kind of crossover space between kind of artists and technologists in, in Peckham, which I'll talk about a little bit later as well. Working with uh, Hannah Barry, who again is an amazing uh, entrepreneur that we brought to Australia recently, who's somebody who's reshaping, again, cultural experiences. So this is a car park on the sort of far top right in Peckham. It's the kind of car park that not many people wanted to park their cars in. Um, you would step into the elevators and there would be certain kind of unpleasant smells. And I remember the first time I went thinking this is quite an interesting place to have a kind of major new arts venue. But what Hannah had worked out is that all of these sort of empty spaces would be incredible spaces for sculpture and artistic uh, installations. And about five or six years ago, um, she started sort of holding shows in the space. And she was one of uh, London's leading emerging um, visual arts gallerists was able to pull her connections of artists all over the world to do some pretty amazing shows in there and started to attract support from people like Bloomberg and other supporters for the quality of work of what she was doing. But she had an initial partnership with Campari and the space you can see here at the bottom is the top of this car park, which actually she worked out had some of the best views over London into the city. And she created um, uh, Frank's Campari Bar. Um, and pretty much on a Thursday and Friday night, the kind of hipsters would empty off the trains into Peckham, which at this point was a pretty uncool part of London, um, and come into these spaces. And it was a way of kind of funding the rest of what was happening in the space. And this has um, developed to such a point that, um, you know, Nicholas Sorota, the, the director of Tate, said this is one of the most vibrant reuses or colonizations of spaces anywhere in the city. Vogue have talked about Peckham as a new cultural epicenter of the city. And really it's been driven by the sort of the big idea, the bold vision of, of, of one person to recognize that there was an opportunity to do something in a different way. Uh, on a larger scale, um, and this is, I guess, is where you can perhaps engineer the same thing if, if, if what Hannah did was very organic. Here East is uh, based in London's Olympic Park. And what they've said there is, because you've got Shoreditch and a lot of these uh, technologists and the half a million people you know, working alongside the artists and other people there, let's build some massive purpose-built spaces for the makers. And the whole branding of the Olympic Park is a space for the creative industries, which again shows you how significant kind of arts, culture, the creative industries are on the economic scale now, because actually that's their, their strategy for success is to base it around the creative industries. 
So of course, you know, that's a, a grander scale, but how do you kind of support that journey from bedroom creative to creative entrepreneur? Um, and there are lots of spaces that they're inhabiting. So, um, you know, when we were first starting out with Coach Label and we had no money for an office or anything like that, uh, we would go to kind of the Welcome Collection. Um, and they had these beautiful, amazing spaces that were, you know, low cost or free for you to go and hang out. And what would happen is, you know, libraries are becoming kind of the, you know, the alternative co-working spaces that don't cost very much. And some libraries have recognized that and have developed spaces where you can come together and not work in silence or in silo, but can hang around with the three or four people that you're developing an idea with. And it's fine, you don't even have to buy a coffee and you can have those conversations. And they basically they have the same kind of culture as co-working spaces. Um, there are um, now much larger scale versions of that. So this is um, Shoreditch House, which is a space in, in, uh, in Shoreditch in London. You can see the kind of design during the day, their tables in the evening, it becomes the kind of ping pong area. And they developed a whole brand around being a kind of private members club for the creative industries. And private members clubs were a pretty kind of old fashioned concept. And Soho House or Shoreditch House completely changed that notion by saying this is a kind of in effect building a network or a community of people working in the creative industry so they could come together. It was the kind of space where you could bring a client to or obviously you could work in the same way as well. And there's a very similar organization now has sprung up in um, Sydney. It's followed the same model um, called Workspace. So it's kind of like a co-working space for the, the creative industries, for artists, designers, um, and they've now just opened a space in Melbourne as well. So these new types of spaces are emerging where creators can hang out and develop you know, new types of ideas. And as I mentioned, this is really happening in, in libraries. So the new um, Geelong Library in Victoria, for me, is a fantastic example of how you can reinvent that library model um, as a space that is akin in, in quality of design to any of the kind of co-working spaces that I've showed you. Um, a project that I've worked on for the last 12 months in Victoria is um, Acme X. Um, and I guess this is about how do you create that co-working and innovation environment inside of an institution? Because some of this is also about um, entrepreneurship, you know, how you, how you develop change within organizations. Um, and I think Acme X is kind of interesting and it opened um, earlier this year, so, so this is the space. Um, because Acme were, uh, obviously sort of looking after what I, what I think is a really interesting area. So if you think about the moving image, that's changed massively. You know, you know it includes you know, film and, and, and traditional media, but these days it includes gaming, it includes uh, YouTube stars, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality. All of these things fall within the moving image. Um, and Acme as an institution had obviously captured the story of the moving image, had commented on, on the moving image, it had an amazing collection uh, around the moving image. But there was a real opportunity to engage with the creative entrepreneurs that were absolutely the people who were shaping the future of the moving image, which was quite a different um, position for them to be on their, their spectrum as a cultural organization. So we developed a kind of co-working space and um, it, hold, it has 60 desks. Um, and there were a hand-picked group of people, again, working in areas like virtual reality, augmented reality, that we brought into the space. And they sit in the same space as the rest of the, the ACME team. And the idea is to, is to create an opportunity with this kind of social space and kitchen area for those creative collisions to happen. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a big experiment, so it's only been open three or four months, and, and, and the proof will be in the pudding. But the hope is that over a period of years, that ACME will start to be able to co-produce or co-create things with these entrepreneurs that will go into the public spaces. The benefits for the entrepreneurs are obvious. Acme has about 1.3 million visitors per year, so there's a chance to uh, test concepts with a kind of public audience that also potentially have commercial potential, which you know potentially Acme can benefit, with, benefit from as well. Um, all of this is kind of happening in a space where also Atme will get to connect with people who are obviously at the leading edge of the moving image. It also helps to future-proof them as an organization because they have an everyday contact with uh, you know, pretty amazing creative entrepreneurs. Um, so here's a number of the events that are taking place. And the events program is absolutely critical. So the idea is there'll be lots of events. Again, they're all about exploring the kind of future of the moving image. So you can see examples there like coding in, in cinema. Um, and a lot of kind of social events. And the social events are just designed to create almost those sort of water cooler conversations between the entrepreneurs and, and the team at Acme. 
Um, another example which is, is perhaps taking it a step further is, is around kind of incubation. So um, at Fish Island Labs is a, a, a collaboration between the Barbican as a, a kind of uh, multi-purpose art centre in London uh, and the Trampery, another co-working space. And what they have is a group of people that over a period of a year go on a programme all, ar all around working in the kind of digital arts. So again, this, this collaboration between tech and culture. And another example would be kind of the New Museum, which is a space in, in New York. And again, they have a, an incubation program about bringing visual artists together with technologists as well. So these are kind of springing up all over the world. And again, they're just spaces that are about you know, these shared conversations. Um, taking it a step further, um, a model that's been really successful in the tech world for growing these creative enterprises is uh, something known as accelerators. Uh, and what accelerators do is they take um, a small number of companies on a journey over a relatively short space of time, might be 12 weeks, and they would get, say, 10 founders of uh, tech startup companies that showed promise. And over this 12 weeks, they get access to mentors. They obviously get to work alongside each other. They've probably got a lot of the same challenges and, and, and opportunities. And they'll get kind of legal advice. And they'll get small amounts of investment. And the idea is, in terms of the journey of their company, over those three months, they can get from A to H rather than just some kind of A to B if they'd kind of modeled along themselves. Um, and it's been really, really successful at growing a number of um, tech companies very, very quickly that um, you know, many of which you'll have heard of. So we did a piece of work for the UK government uh, innovation agency, Nestor, about saying, well, what ideas, what models can we borrow from places like Silicon Valley and apply them to the arts? So in the last 12 months, they've just announced the first ever accelerator for the arts in the UK, which is about taking that sort of Silicon Valley infrastructure and applying it to uh, creative enterprises and arts organizations. Um, and it's happening over here as well. So in, in New Zealand, uh, the, exactly the same model has been adopted by the Tapapa Museum, the National Museum of New Zealand. So as you can see there, there are kind of 12 challenges, which are a whole range of challenges that the museum has. You know, how do they appeal to different audiences? How do they think about uh, issues to do with, with access? Um, how do they think about issues to do with getting their, their content and their collections out there in a new way? And they've challenged 10 teams to spend four months within the museum to work on those problems, those, those opportunities, and to come up with new ideas. And every team, and it's been supported by Vodafone um, and various other partners, gets 20,000 uh, New Zealand dollars during that period. Um, and that can be money simply to kind of live on so that they can you know, quit their jobs or whatever they need to do in order to take part in the, in the project, you know, pay the bills. They get access to all of Tapapa's experts, collections, and visitors. Um, they get obviously that kind of knowledge imparted to understand the cultural sector and what the issues are facing the cultural sector. They get access to the wider network of Tapapa, so you know visits from international experts, both on the digital side and the entertainment sector. So Tapapa really using its brand and reach, and also its partners' reach in this case, Vodafone, um, and then the opportunity to visit um, you know global cultural leaders and international experts in the field. But as I mentioned, the same way as um, Acme, to really market test those ideas on on the visitors and. In, in the, uh, the institution. And they've managed to get 150,000 from Vodafone to fund that. So again, it's not waiting for the, the check to arrive. They've gone out and found partners to do it. So again, it's an entirely new initiative. We'll see what happens, but it's a really interesting model, I think. Um, I'm gonna flick on a little bit, go look at more about sort of supplying for demand. Because I think what's interesting is some of this stuff's being doing, but done by organizations. A lot of it is actually happening through individuals. Um, so the founder behind this idea, Mojis, is a classically trained musician. And he had a, an idea, it's one of those sort of ridiculous change the world type ideas, is um, could you create a piece of technology that allowed somebody to play literally any physical object? So as you can see, there's a device there that plugs into your phone. Um, and we had him at Remix where he did a performance and he would attach the object to say a chair and then using the technology and the software in the, um, in the phone could then turn anything on the stage, and he did turn everything on the stage into a musical instrument, and then he played this incredible piece of music. Um, and what was interesting about it was, if you have an idea like that, he was a technologist as well as a musician, how do you make it happen? And what's happening is, of course, there are some areas that are mentioned a lot now, that crowdfunding, but what we're finding is there are different types of finances coming together to allow people to make their ideas into a reality. So in his case, he raised about $200,000 via Kickstarter. 
a pretty impressive sum of money, and it turned out other people believed this was a big idea, and he created a very compelling campaign to get that money. And of course, a lot of this is about the rewards and the creativity that you put into the rewards, in his case, selling the devices. Um, so really, it was just showing that there was a market for those devices. So a lot of that 200,000 was people saying, this sounds like a great idea. If it works, I'll buy one. Um, but what he then used was that as evidence to go to uh, other investors.